Viewer discretion is advised. Decontamination. Earlier that evening, within a dark room close by, a man hid inside as he ducked under a window, mindful of the threat just outside. It was a cartel soldier, and this soldier was one of Santiago's lieutenants. He was wearing military fatigues as he held a rifle while clinging to the wall beneath the window. Although the room was darkened by nightfall, it was dimly lit by the silvery glows of moonlight shining through the remaining broken plates of glass. It was a small, empty space he had found, void of carpet or furniture, just thin wooden walls with hardwood flooring. He could barely make out the conversation, but was getting the gist of what was being said outside. There was no more gunfire, but he knew the threat was still there. He slowly positioned himself to see through the bottom right corner of the second floor window. He was trying to keep his breathing down, attempting to quell the adrenaline that had recently overtaken him during his escape. As he peered through his corner of the window, he noticed a dim, dusty area mired in mud tracks where he once stood, dead bodies still strewn about, unable to make out who was who. All he knew is that his side had lost and the dead bodies were likely his fallen comrades. He watched as flashlights and red sniper targeting dots darted around the darkened grounds below, near the truck he had recently parked with his two hostages in it, Delilah and Caleb. As he came closer to the window, he could hear faint conversations below. But it was one voice in particular that he was paying close attention to. A 
female voice that seemed to be the leader of this advancing American foe. It was apparent from her speaking that she was directing her words at the four prisoners he once held captive along with his fellow soldiers. We haven't made our way to Esmeralda yet, so we're not exactly certain. But we do know the cartel leader was the infamous Lazar. Goes by the Chancellor now, though. Used to have him locked up in Colorado. According to our sources on the ground, him and a few of his men are personally seeking this revenge. If you come across this group, stay clear of them. They have a death wish. It's not good to be on this gangster's mind. They're seeking the group's leader himself. The voice he was listening to started to trail off. Perhaps the Americans were vacating, he thought. A few final faint words were heard in the distance. I believe his name is Trevor Meeks. This was a good thing, the cartel soldier thought to himself. They're leaving, and they're not taking Trevor and his family with them. In fact, they had no idea this was Trevor Meeks below. He wasn't sure why Trevor hadn't revealed himself to them, but he didn't care. He had to form a plan, and he had to form this plan quickly. The Chancellor would want revenge on whomever killed his brother. And seeing that the US military had moved in with overwhelming air and firepower, Trevor would definitely fit the profile of a consolation candidate. It could be his ticket to propel himself up the cartel ranks. He peered through the window and saw that the American threat had vanished and noticed Trevor and his group scrambling to depart as well. He gathered himself up and feeling confident he wasn't going to be met by the Americans any longer, he quickly made his way downstairs. Then, he silently ran across a dark room with the most stealth he could possibly execute to a doorway leading out to his newest target, this relentless Trevor, and what little was now left of his team. Seeing a path, now clear of the recent American threat, the soldier quickly ran out onto the dirt ground only to see the glow of red tail lights driving away. Now, he had remembered he had left the vehicle running before his escape, and his target was quickly disappearing within it. As he spun around, slowly realizing he had no vehicles of his own, he aimed his gun at the distant and fading truck, but then thought to himself. He looked behind him in the direction he had heard the American's head, and hesitated. Finally, with a new strategy in his head, and not wanting to draw his enemies back to the sound of gunfire, he shouldered his weapon and ran into the darkness, heading toward the center of town to see if he could obtain another vehicle or even a horse. To his utter amazement, causing him to stop dead in his tracks, right around a building's corner, there in a darkened alleyway, stood a frightened horse tied to a metal post. He quickly mounted the panicked beast and calmed it by rubbing its mane. He then reached over, took out a knife, and cut the horse free as he guided it back to the bloody battlefield. And there, sitting upon his newly acquired mode of transportation, he looked one more time at where Trevor and his family had disappeared through the dense jungle surrounding the field and nearby buildings. As he thought of possibly catching up to the four targets, all escaping together once more, he pulled a flat device out of a pocket near his chest and looked at it. It was a small black device that he now held as he quickly studied it. Then, he peered back up to where his target had vanished and smiled. He gathered the horse's reins and gave them a quick tug and whistled for the beast to make haste. But instead of trailing the crippled team of four, he once sought to contain, he speedily took off into the opposite direction. He was now heading toward Esmeralda, eventually disappearing into the shadowy wilderness himself, just beyond the streets of Vuelta Larga. Later in the morning, a sliver of sunlight began to peek over the Andes mountain range, submerging the small coastal community of Tom Supa in a calm amber light. The once dark, heavenly skies now held hostage ripples of sun rays across its vast, cloudy, and overcast prison. The atmosphere over the seas met with its counterparts 
over the nearby woodland and whisked about a mild early morning storm. Gusts of winds traveled effortlessly across the jungle canopy, sending leaves into a flurried frenzy as they were swept from their lifelines of canopies below. Fluttering about, they would swirl this way and that. Some of them would dance in the air for longer, while most would simply succumb to their fate, landing on the cold ground below. It seemed some would find their way to a man-made resting place, a desolate asphalt highway, the dense forest on one side and Tonsupa on the other. Laying there, peacefully resonating to the light storm above, they suddenly departed each other's company as a disturbance began to take hold. On the vacant, overgrown paved road, a familiar small military truck made its way upon the solid surface as the ever-changing morning sunlight washed over the Ecuadorian jungles. Adding to the light breeze through the nearby trees, another sound now echoed through the coastal woodlands as six cylinders within its metallic confines roared down the abandoned road. But as mechanical clanks began to interrupt the deep hum of this swiftly traveling vehicle, it ultimately slowed to a full stop along the abandoned expressway's shoulder, unable to accomplish furthering its journey onward. Are we stopping? Caleb asked as he sat in the back, next to his sister. Trevor, sitting in the driver's seat, looked at Beck next to him, then into the rearview mirror where he could see Delilah and Caleb. I'm afraid so. That's as far as this one is taking us. We're gonna have to walk for a little bit, he replied, glancing back at Beck with slight worry in his eye. Caleb and Delilah smiled. They were just happy to be back with their two guardians. Beck looked over at her brother. So what's the plan? Trevor thought for a moment. This is the E-15 South. Should take us all the way to Punta Blanca. We need to make sure we stay close to it. I say we walk alongside of it in the forest until we see another car. We're likely to find something. The car grew quiet as Beck and Trevor thought of ideas to strengthen the proposed strategy. Beck finally broke the silence. Works for me. Let's go, she said as she turned her whole body to look at the kids. Come on, guys. You want to go for a little hike? The two kids smiled back at her as Delilah chimed in. I get to be the leader. No, I'm the leader. Caleb rebutted with disdain in his voice. Beck let out a small laugh. You guys can take turns being the leader. Come on, let's get our things. With that, the four of them began to gather their mismatched duffel bags and backpacks together in preparation for their inevitable family outing. Both Trevor and his sister knew the gas would only get them so far. They were just praying to spot something before then. The alluring forest held a delicate splendor as lush and leafy ivy meandered up and down the trees and across the scenic landscape. The earth was a dark brown and bragged of rich soil as small puddles gathered here and there. Trevor cautiously stepped through the low-lying foliage, a camouflage duffel bag on his side, while Delilah bravely led the group in front of him, wearing a beige backpack. Caleb was following directly behind, as Beck dutifully guarded the back of the line. Beck decided to lift the children's spirits with a game her and Trevor used to play on their own family outings. You guys want to play a game? Trevor, still walking, looked back at his sister and smiled as he knew what she was suggesting. Yes, both kids exclaimed. The four kept walking through the forest alongside the highway as Beck began to explain the rules. Their voices faded as they made their way through the trees, beginning their long journeys ahead. Okay, it's kind of like I Spy, but with a twist. It has to be something you can see. Can it be a tree? Caleb asked. Of course. But you don't describe it. You just say the first letter. Like T for tree. That's the twist. And you're not allowed to cheat, Trevor added. 
I don't cheat. Anyway, if someone requests one, you can give them the next letter. Like R after T and tree? Delilah asked. Yes, just like that. Whoever guesses the word gets a point for every letter left. Their voices finally faded away as they made their journey through the jungle's thicket. The forest now held a peaceful daylight glow while rays of sunlight broke through the stormy clouds and transcended the thick leaves above. About a mile ahead, a slight clearing of trees about the size of a small softball field stood as a small obstacle of vulnerability to the fore. And from this clearing, the sounds of the traveling family could be heard coming closer. L, Delilah guessed. Nope, quipped Caleb. I want a letter. You already got your letter. Plus, Uncle Trevor gave you his too. Everyone quiet, Trevor whispered as they approached a sudden end to their covered paths. Let's pause the game for a little bit, okay? He looked at Beck as she moved to where he was standing. He continued speaking, strategizing their next move. Doesn't seem like a problem, just a short time of being in the open. Beck was about to agree in response when they all heard a familiar sound in the distance. Is that a plane? She asked, looking at her brother. Trevor turned toward the open field and beyond the forest at the other end, where the noise seemed to be coming from. Sounds like aircraft. Jets. A few of them. He answered, looking toward the incoming noise with wonder. The noise grew louder and began to vibrate in their bodies as they surveyed the small patch of sky above them. Just then, as if they were close enough to touch, two military fighter jets flew over the forest they were hiding in sending echoes of deep shockwaves that resonated within the four. Beck and Trevor threw a glance at each other with confusion and suspicion in their eyes. The four then began running toward the highway they had been skirting to visualize the aircraft's pathways. They made it to the edge of the asphalt, where they could once again see the planes, now far off into the distance. Suddenly, both jets made an immediate change in flight pattern as they both pitched straight up into the air. Beck and Trevor knew what to expect next as they each grabbed a child and braced themselves to the ground. Within seconds, a loud, thundering explosion resounded across the vast jungles. Still grasping a child each, Trevor and Beck looked over to see a plume of smoke work its way up into the atmosphere. Beck looked over at her brother. Esmeralda, Trevor, still looking at the distant explosion, slightly shook his head, signaling that her answer was close, but not completely accurate. Vuelta Larga, he answered as he gathered himself back up. The three others followed his lead as they all looked off into the murky overcast horizon, where the smoke was now gathering into a spherical-like shape. While standing alongside the highway in awe of the far-flung devastation, the group had just witnessed, they all heard it at the same time. A sound of approaching vehicles from behind them. They all turned in unison to lay their sights on the sounds approaching them. It appeared to be a bus, though faint and far away. They could make out the bus's yellow siding and distinctive front grille. Immediately, without any need of formulating a plan and in complete lack of hesitation, the small family ran to the nearby woods to gain cover. A good hundred feet into the forest, the four hid behind a couple large trees that housed a large boulder in between them. They hid Caleb and Delilah behind the enormous rock as Trevor and Beck looked out to survey the unknown travelers. Eventually, the sound became louder as the vehicle approached, the sound of its engine filling them with anxiety. They waited there by the trees, completely still and silent as the bus finally came into view. To their dismay, the large vehicle seemed to slow as it pulled to the side of the road. Suddenly, making the situation much more dire, two large military trucks followed the bus directly behind it. They all came to a complete stop, led by the bus on the shoulder of the road, across the opposite side of the highway. Trevor looked over at Beck. You think they might have seen us? 
She just shrugged her shoulders and took off her backpack and placed it on the ground. She looked back at the kids and then into her bag while she began speaking to her brother. Those fucking Americans took all the guns from Santiago's men, so we're defenseless here. If they've seen us, we run, she said as she pulled out a pair of binoculars. Looking through them, she could see a few men get out of one of the trucks and approach the bus. Trevor, straining his eyes, could see them too. He didn't forget to comfort the kids as he looked over and threw them a smile. Just stay quiet. We'll be on our way soon. They looked up at him and nodded their heads, then sat down together behind the rock. Trevor continued to squint his eyes and see what Beck was seeing. Then his sister spoke up in a hushed manner. They're American. Trevor straightened up and responded. No problem then, right? Beck, still peering through her binoculars, replied. I don't know. Something's not right here. Stay quiet, she answered. They both knew that the American forces were focused on their jobs and secretive about their objectives as well. They also knew that they wouldn't hesitate removing any foreseeable obstacles from their paths. So as they studied the scene before them begin to play out, they did so quietly. They then could hear the Marines in the distance shouting to people on the bus. They appeared to be ordering everyone off as passengers slowly began to disembark. Beck then quietly spoke to her brother. They look like the people that lived in those open pastures, she said, handing Trevor the binoculars. He took them into his hands and placed them to his face as he viewed the drama unfolding across the unused lanes of highway. He saw a bunch of Hispanic women and children in tattered clothing unboarding as they were all being shouted at by the officers. It's just women and children, he said as he continued to watch them follow orders. They all lined up along the length of the bus as a few Marines walked a few feet away and faced them as if they were about to address the group. Trevor watched on as one officer began shouting to the group, unable to hear exactly what was being said as they were too far away and not speaking English. Suddenly his heart dropped and his veins ran cold, a feeling he was getting all too familiar with. In sheer horror, they watched the three soldiers raise their weapons as they placed a relentless rapid fire among the innocent crowd. There was no screaming to be heard as it was over within just a few seconds. The passengers from the bus now lay in a bloody disarray of lifeless human bodies. Trevor quickly scrambled with his sister as they ducked behind the rock and held the kids close to them, all of them now sitting against the large boulder. Trevor looked over at his sister as she spoke to him. They're just killing them all like sick cattle. Trevor put his hands to his forehead and forcefully wiped his brow, attempting to calm himself down. Hearing his sister's words and in agreement with her conclusions, he looked over at her to respond. But before he was able to speak, they suddenly heard more aircraft screech across the sky above. The four of them looked up, but could not see anything as the leafy canopy was too thick. Realizing what was about to happen, they looked at each other and grabbed the kids closer to a huddle once more, bracing for an imminent blast. And within seconds, additional aerial fire hitting the earth off in the distance violently shook the soil beneath them as they all clutched each other tightly. Trevor finally responded to his sister's most recent comment. Decontamination. Earlier, that very same morning, a subtle mist poured through the low-lying fauna as faint streams of silvery light meandered through the jungle. A slight buildup of moisture in the air left a sparkling condensation over a grassy bank leading up from the woodland to the streets of Esmeralda, just past an overgrown patch of asphalt where the wild met with the nearby cement jungle. A cartel soldier riding horseback quickly navigated himself through the corridors of the eerily quiet coastal town. The cartel soldier had quickly made his way through the connecting jungles, leading him from one town to the next. While moving swiftly, 
He minded the forest for any adversaries in his path or possible surroundings. While maintaining caution and keeping guard, it had taken him a few hours to complete the journey as the early morning dawn began to show signs of a small impending storm above. The morning twilight gave the soldier a sense of ease as he made the last leg of his small expedition through the streets of Esmeralda. The Chancellor's Citadel was about 300 feet in front of him as it came into view upon rounding a building's corner. He noticed the gates ahead at the capital were open and most of the Chancellor's vehicles were lined up on the streets outside. Many of his fellow cartel men were working alongside Russians, about 50 or so all together, loading the vehicles. He knew immediately they were heading for higher ground, sensing the incoming threat from their adversaries, which had infiltrated their neighbor to the north. The Chancellor's scouts must have informed him of the American insurgents. He had barely escaped. As he closed the distance between himself and the large complex of Spanish buildings, he noticed residents staring at him from the windows of nearby dilapidated houses. He then observed a few looks from some of the men scurrying about as he approached the grounds of the cartel and Russian stronghold, now just a stone's throw away. Gonzalez, a man spoke firmly from within the men working to hasten their departure. Everyone froze, including the cartel soldier now approaching on horseback. He looked at the militarized crowd, now parting way for the man who yelled his name. Eventually, the Chancellor appeared in front of him, an armed soldier by his side. The Chancellor continued to speak. Where are your men? What of my brother? Gonzales, the man on the horse, looked at the Chancellor and let his face fall communicating to him wordlessly of his brother's fate. The Chancellor did not react. He just looked at the horseman as an expression of rage began to take hold of his face. Nevertheless, he continued to speak to Gonzalez. Come, tell me more. He slipped from his horse and landed on his feet on the earth below while keeping his gaze intently on the Chancellor. As he gathered his words within his mind, he respectfully approached his former boss's brother. It was an ambush, sir. Our entire defense was caught off guard. We had secured the insurrectionists, all three of them. Eduardo brought them to us through a plot your brother had come up with a few days ago. When we were executing the rebels as you ordered, we were taken by American soldiers on both sides of us, but not before we were able to execute one of them. I believe your brother was killed first. He was probably their main target at that location, sir. I'm sorry, sir, but I wanted to get to you as soon as possible and warn you of the threat. A Russian soldier stepped forward and looked at Gonzalez with disgust. Then he looked over at the Chancellor and said something in Russian. Предатель. The Chancellor exchanged glances with the Russian as his facial expression grew more stern. He looked back at Gonzalez and urged the nervous soldier to continue. Go on, Gonzalez continued, but before he could speak, he noticed someone descending the capital steps. He did not know this man personally, but he did know of him. It was a taller, thin American man with blonde hair and blue eyes. He knew his name was Horatio, and he knew that he was well acquainted with the Chancellor and was Kent's son. He finally shook the distraction and began to speak. After the Americans had retracted, I tried to recapture the prisoners, but the Americans had cut them loose and they had already fled in my vehicle. Please tell me, Gonzalez, the Chancellor stated, the one that you executed was Mr. Meeks. No, sir. It was the other man with him. His friend, sir, Gonzalez replied. The Chancellor's eyes flashed with anger and gave a telling look to Gonzalez that his story was not going well and that there had better be some good news in store or things might end badly for the soldier. Gonzalez took his cue without hesitation, proudly announcing his silver lining. He withdrew the small handheld device from his pocket. He looked at it and smiled, then looked up at the Chancellor. 
I know their exact location, sir. The Chancellor looked down at the device his soldier held as his eyes slightly widened and a slow, mild smirk grew from his lips. He walked up to his soldier and firmly grabbed his shoulder with one hand in a manner that spoke of reward. With his other hand, he took the handheld device from Gonzalez and looked at it. With one more large smile, he began to speak so that everyone around could hear him. This is a job well done, Lieutenant. Everyone here should take notice of the Lieutenant's good work. Gonzalez nervously smiled, looking at his boss smiling back at him. Then he watched as the Chancellor leaned in for a more private dialogue as his face became fierce with rage once again, melting his delighted disposition away with it. The Chancellor spoke once again, this time only slightly above his own breath. If my brother is dead, Gonzalez, then why are you here? Just then, a gunshot sounded off and was met with the splattering of blood all over the Chancellor's face. Gonzalez, now clinging to his last few breaths, dropped heavily onto the soil at the Chancellor's feet. The Chancellor then looked down at the dying man with indifference, while putting his pistol back in its place under his belt behind him. With that, he gathered his leader-like composure and turned to Horatio. Horatio, he yelled as he tossed the device to him. I have my hands full with these ridiculous Americans. Consider your mentoring over. I have two tasks for you now. The Chancellor spoke while his volume decreased as he approached the boy half his age. These people. This Trevor Meeks. It's your responsibility now. Remember, he continued as he looked over the crowd of his men and then back at Horatio. This man and his group hung your own father and his two men right here on these grounds. The Chancellor then leaned into Horatio and said in a whisper, Make them bleed. Horatio smiled as he pocketed the device, then posed a question to his mentor. And the second task, sir? The Chancellor took a pistol from around his back and handed it to Horatio. He stepped closer to the young man and put an arm around his shoulder and announced to the crowd. Nobody calls my men traitors. He then looked to the Russian, who spoke a single word to him minutes ago, and continued, even if they are. With that, Horatio accomplished his second task first. He lifted his pistol and shot the outspoken Russian from earlier, right between the eyes. The Russians in the group loudly rejected the brazen show of force, but were soon quelled by the outnumbering cartel men around them readying their weapons, preparing to back their leader's display. As the crowd became silent once again, the Chancellor regained their attention. He addressed the now seized Russians in his outfit in their own language. Comrades, your armies have been depleted from one region to the next. Those of you left can choose to work for me or join your friend here on the dirt. You are far away from home and new recruits are an issue for you. Know this, this is my home and my recruits will keep rising. So, the choice is yours. The crowd of men stayed quiet as the Chancellor moved away from Horatio and headed toward the Capitol doors. He turned and looked at all of his men before disappearing into the Capitol building. Horatio, you have your orders. You may take two men with you. The rest of you, our scouts, have found American aircraft heading this way. We have less than one hour to move out. Leave the residence. Horatio looked down at the device he was removing from his pocket. It was simply a black GPS receiver with a darkened black screen underneath a thin cracked glass cover. Within the black screen was a green dot in the center and at the bordering lower edge of the screen, a red light soundlessly blinked away.